Hi everyone, welcome back. In this section we're going to look at derivatives of multivariable functions. Because a multivariable function has more than one variable, we can talk about taking its derivative with respect to any one of its variables. These are known as the partial derivatives. The definition is given below. It says that the partial derivative with respect to x or with respect to y of a multivariable function f of x, y is given by these limits of the difference quotients. The idea is that the partial derivative of f with respect to x is obtained by doing a little increment of f in the x direction. So we go f of x plus h and y minus f of x and y is just the change in f as we move a little bit in the x direction. And then we divide by that change, divide by that h, and we get our limit of a difference quotient. This is known as the partial derivative of f with respect to x. We are essentially treating y as a constant all the way along there, just basically ignoring y, treating it as a constant, and just doing our normal derivative with respect to x. And similarly for the partial derivative with respect to y. Let's get a feel for what this actually does geometrically. So the idea is we've got our surface and we've got a particular point on our surface. What are these partial derivatives trying to capture? Well they're trying to capture how the z value, how the output changes with changes in the input. And with the particular changes in the input we are interested in isolating our change so that we only change in the x direction or we only change in the y direction. So let's just focus on changing just in the x direction to begin with. So that is, at this point, we are going to look at only points on this surface that have the same y value as the point indicated. So that means we are interested in the points on the surface that also live on this plane. If that point is given by x value a and y value b, then this is the plane y equals b. Now the plane intersects the surface in a curve, so we can draw that curve in. And just remember that the positive x goes to the left, so it might be better to look at it if we want to sort of draw the analogy with calculus 1, to look at it from behind. So now, if I just get rid of that surface temporarily, then what I've got is this black curve that's living in that plane. I've got the x-axis positive x-axis going off to the right and the z-axis going up. And so what we're really interested in is at that particular point on the black curve, how is the z value of the points on that black curve changing as x changes? So in other words, what is the derivative at this point on that black curve? So this is just a calculus one problem now. What's the derivative of the point on the curve? Do we have an equation for this? Absolutely. We had that z was equal to f of x, y, but now y is a fixed constant. Let's say y is b. So now we've got this curve, z equals f of x comma b. So z is a function of x. And we can just differentiate as we normally would from calculus 1. Differentiate the expression with respect to x, and we get our derivative. So what we would have effectively cal calculated then is the slope of the tangent line. Instead of putting a tangent line in there, I'll just put a tangent vector. So we can compute that vector using calculus one techniques. In fact, we can compute the slope of that vector, the rise over the run, or the y component of that vector over the x component. That would be the derivative of the function with respect to x. Okay, so we boiled the problem down of at least figuring out how does z change with respect to x. We boiled it down to a calculus one problem. But there was a full surface here, so there's more than one direction. So we can do the same thing in the y direction. We could say, now let's fix the x value. Whatever the x value is, let's say it's a. And then we draw a plane, x equals a, that intersects the surface. That surface and plane intersect along a curve. I'll get rid of the surface now so you can see the curve. So there's that black curve and the red plane. And again, we are interested in the slope of the tangent line, or the derivative at the point on that black curve. This is now z is a function of y. So it's f of a comma y. So it's a function of y. We can compute its derivative. 
and in this case I will put the derivative in as a tangent vector. So there's the tangent vector to the curve. And so what we've done now, if we sort of take a step back, is we've said, ah, we've found some rates of change. We found how z changes with respect to x, so a change in x, what's the corresponding change in z? That's given by the green vector. How does z change with respect to y? That's given by the red vector. And that's really what we're doing in this section, is we are going to be computing the slopes of these two vectors, because those are just the derivatives of the function f of x, y, relative to each of the variables, treating the other one as a constant. The next section, in 14.4, we're going to continue on with this diagram and we're going to say, hey, what we've got here is two vectors that are tangent to the surface. So if I'm interested in finding a tangent plane, so a plane that best approximates the surface at that point, here I'll, I'll put one in the diagram, so there's our tangent plane. That's the plane that best approximates the surface at that point. What do we notice about those two tangent vectors? Well, they're two vectors that live in the plane. Oh, so I have two vectors that live in the plane. If I compute their cross product, that gives me a normal vector to the plane. And therefore, I can find the tangent plane by using the two tangent vectors and a cross product. So that's where we're gonna go in section 14.4. But in this section, we'll just back it up a little bit and say what we're really interested in is finding the slopes of these two vectors. So let's get that diagram sketched in our notes. So we've got our coordinate axes, x, y, and z. We've got our surface, maybe something like this, and we've got our point. And for this surface and this point, if we pass through the point moving only in the x direction, then I get a curve that looks like something like this. And that curve is essentially coming from the fact that we've got z is equal to f of x is allowed to change, but y we have fixed to be b. And that's if this point here on the surface has x value a, y value b, and then the corresponding height of that point, of course, will be, maybe I'll draw it like this with a little bit of perspective then, the corresponding height of that point would be f of a, b. So we've got this green curve, and then we're saying that we would like to know all along this green curve, how is the z value changing? with respect to changes in the x value. So along that curve, we can get that the rate of change in z with respect to x is, it's the derivative, so dz dx, or it's the derivative of, I'll change these to d's because now we're thinking of, we are differentiating, just like in calculus one, we are differentiating with respect to x, this expression in x alone. So that's the rate of change in z with respect to x, and that's what we're gonna call del f del x. And now we can do the same thing in the other direction. We can say, what if we fix our x value and let y change. Then we get this curve in a plane, z is equal to f of a y, and then we get the rate of change in z with respect to y, and that is dz dy, which is the derivative with respect to y, of f of a comma y. So that's our regular just calculus one derivative and that is also denoted by del f 
del y or df dy. So the thing to notice is a little bit of a slight change in notation for derivatives now. Because our function f, because our function f consists of two variables, when we write its derivative, we use this script d, d notation. So this is known as a del. And this is denoting the fact that f is made up of two variables, and we're looking at the rate of change of f with respect to only one of the variables. In, that, in the first case, it's x. In the second case, it would be with respect to y. So how do we actually compute a derivative? Well, in order to calculate one of these partial derivatives, we just regard, in this case, the derivative with respect to x. We regard y as a constant and just differentiate with respect to x, similarly to get the partial with respect to y. So let's look at an example. In this example, we want to compute the first order partial derivative of z with respect to x and then also with respect to y. So the first thing we'll do is compute dz dx. dz dx, we're going to treat y as a constant. So I'm interested in computing the derivative with respect to x of this expression. Your first thought might be this looks like a quotient, so we're going to use the quotient rule. And we could certainly do that, but we could notice that the expression on the denominator involves a y and doesn't involve x at all. So it's really a constant with respect to x. So we could actually pull that out front. We can pull it all the way out front and then just differentiate what's left over, the e to the x minus y sine x. We can differentiate that with respect to x. And so when we differentiate that expression, that becomes the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of negative y sine of x, we're thinking of y as a constant. We only care about the variable x. So the derivative of sine x is cos x. So this becomes negative y cos x all over 1 minus cos of y. You could use the quotient rule. I've avoided it, so maybe I'll put an or down here. I've avoided it because it's in some sense unnecessary here because the denominator was a constant relative to x, but we could use the quotient rule. So if we went dz dx and we wanted to use the quotient rule to do this, we would say it's the derivative of the top function. So I'm again looking up at this expression here. The derivative of the top function is e to the x minus y cos x, that's the derivative of the top, times the bottom, 1 minus cos y, minus the top function, e to the x minus y sine x, times the derivative of the bottom. But the bottom does not have an x variable in it, so it's effectively constant with respect to x, so its derivative would be 0. And then all of that's over the bottom squared, 1 minus cos of y all squared, and now we can see we get some cancellation. And so we get the same answer we had above. So we could use the quotient rule. It will give us the same result. But again, we still have to note that there is this term that is 0. And this is because we treat y as a constant because our derivative is with respect to x. How about the derivative with respect to y now? Well, the derivative with respect to y of this expression. Now here we're going to use the quotient rule because it is the ratio of some function in y over another function in y. So what the quotient rule says is the derivative of the top. The derivative of the top is negative sine x times the bottom, 1 minus cos y, minus the top function, e to the x minus y sine x, times the derivative of the bottom function. The derivative of negative cosine of y is sine of y. And all of that is over the bottom function squared. And so that was the quotient rule in order to compute that derivative. So there we go. There we've computed the two partial derivatives of this function. The idea, again, being that to compute a partial derivative, pick the variable that you want to compute the partial with respect to, 
and then treat the other variable as a constant relative to it. And then just differentiate as you normally would from calculus 1. Let's have a look at another example. We've got the volume of one mole of an ideal gas is given by V is equal to 82.06 times T over P, where P is the pressure and T is the temperature in kelvins. Find the rates of change of the volume with respect to pressure. So we want a rate of change in volume with respect to pressure and we also want with respect to temperature. So this one is telling us we want to find the partial derivative of V with respect to P and this one is telling us that we want to find the derivative, partial derivative of V with respect to T. So let's go ahead and work on those. dV dP means we are differentiating with respect to P our volume function. So that's 82.06 times T all over P. The derivative of that, again, it's just some constant over P. So we really only need to worry about the derivative of 1 over P. So that's 82.06 times T. The derivative of P inverse, the negative comes down and we get P to the negative 2, or in other words, a P squared in the denominator. So that's dV dP. We are interested in particular in the derivative of V with respect to P when T is equal to 300 and P is equal to 5. So that's going to be negative 82.06 times 300 all over 25 or 5 squared. So there is our rate of change in volume with respect to pressure. We should include the units here because this is an applied problem. So what are the units going to be? They're the units of V over the units of P. The units of volume are cubic centimeters, so that's cubic centimeters, divided by the units of pressure, which are atmospheres. And so there's our result. That's how the volume is changing with respect to pressure at the particular moment when the temperature is 300 and the pressure is 5. So specifically what this is telling us is that if we were to increase pressure by one unit, then this is how much the volume would decrease by. So increasing pressure is causing a decrease in volume. Let's have a look at the next one. So I'll section it off. So now we'd like to compute the derivative of V with respect to T. That is the derivative with respect to T of 82.06 T all over P. This is a linear expression in capital T, so its derivative is just going to be 82.06 all over P. So in the particular case where the temperature is 300 and the pressure is 5, we get that the rate of change is 82.06 all over 5. And that's going to be cubic centimeters over, and now this is with respect to temperature, so this is in terms of degrees Kelvin. So what this is telling me now is that if I was to increase temperature from 300 by a little bit, so 300 to like 301, then this is telling me that the volume is going to increase. It's going to increase by about 82.06 over 5 cubic centimeters for every unit that the temperature increases.